Hello and welcome to section 4.7. Today we're going to look at inverse trig functions. And before we talk about inverse trig functions, I want to kind of remind you a little bit about an inverse function. If you recall, an inverse function must be one to one, or in other words, it must pass your horizontal line test in order for it to be an inverse. So if you consider the function y equals sine x, and if you think about the graph, when we sketch the graph, we know that sine is going to look something like this. And if we take a horizontal line and run it through, we see that it's going to fail that horizontal line test. So the function itself as, or the function as it stands, y equals sine x, will not pass the horizontal line test. Therefore, it theoretically does not have an inverse. However, we can restrict our domain. And if we restrict our domain, we're going to restrict it enough so that our function will pass the horizontal line test. So if I go and I restrict my domain, um, and I'm only going to look at the piece between a negative pi over 2 and a positive pi over 2, what you'll see then is we're going to be looking at the piece of the sine graph that's going from here to here. And this would be pi over 2, and this here would be a negative pi over 2. So now if I go and try to do the horizontal line test, I'll see that this function will actually pass. Therefore, my function has an inverse on that restricted domain. So once my domain has been restricted, I can then say that y equals sine x has a unique inverse called the inverse sine function, and it's actually denoted by y equals arc sine of x, or it looks like y equals sine, and it looks like it's being raised to the power of negative 1. But both of these here really mean an inverse sine. This is the actual button that is on your calculator for those of you that have been trying to use that for reciprocals. Um, and I will go over how to use this on your calculators tomorrow in class. So the actual definition of an inverse sine says that y equals the arc sine of x or the inverse sine of x. IFF is if and only if the sine of y equals x. So in other words, if I can take the sine of y and it equals x, then I know I have an inverse function. Our domain then is going to be from negative 1 to 1. And if you think about that, when we had a sine function, our range was negative 1 to 1, and our um, domain was unlimited. Well, in this case, I have to restrict the domain of my sine function, so that's going to affect my range, since y and x are really switching. And on my sine function, my range was from negative 1 to 1, so that means that my domain then becomes negative 1 to 1. So that's how we got these values here. Example 1 then says, if possible, we want to find the exact value of the arc sine of negative 1. Well, the arc sine of negative 1, I can rewrite this and say the sine of x equals negative 1 when. And after doing our unit circle quiz, I hope you can tell me that it's at increments of 3 pi over 2. Now that sounds really great. However, when I'm looking at um, 3 pi over 2, I'm hoping that a red flag goes off because I can't look at um, 3 pi over 2 because it falls outside of my given range. So because it falls outside of my given range, I actually can rewrite 3 pi over 2, and I hope you remember this, if I have my unit circle, um, 3 pi over 2, which is this angle right here, which is really the same thing as if I go this way. And if I go this way, that's a negative pi over 2. Well, a negative pi over 2 will fall within the range of a negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So I'm not going to use 3 pi over 2. I'm actually going to use x equals a negative pi over 2. So if I plug this in and I say the sine of a negative pi over 2, this is going to give me a negative 1. So 
the answer then to my problem, the arc sine of negative 1, equals a negative pi over 2. And that's my final answer. Likewise, when I look at the inverse sine of 1 half, I have to think to myself, when does sine of x equal a positive 1 half? Well, it's got to come from quadrant 1 or quadrant 2. However, quadrant 2 um, is not within my given range, so I know it can only be the quadrant 1 answer. And the quadrant 1 answer um, of sine that will give me 1 half is actually at pi over 6. And finally, I'm going to look at the inverse sine of the square root of 3. So we have to say, when does the sine of x give me the square root of 3? And again, because we just got done taking that unit circle quiz, I hope you realize there is no value of x that will give you the square root of 3. So we can say that there is no solution for this one. Next, we want to sketch a graph of the arc sine of x. So I'm going to go ahead and create a table. And I am going to have y, because remember, it's sine of y equals x. And then I'm going to have x equals the sine of y. So I'm going to start out with my range, which was from a negative pi over 2. And I'm just going to go in nice increments. So negative pi over 2, I'm going to have a negative pi over 4. I'm going to look at a negative pi over 6. 0, pi over 6, pi over 4, and pi over 2. So now when I plug these values in right here, the sine of a negative pi over 2 is actually going to give me a negative 1. The sine of a negative pi over 4 is going to give me a negative square root of 2 over 2. The sine of a negative pi over 6 is going to give me a negative 1 half. The sine of 0 is 0. Sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. Sine of pi over 4 is a square root of 2 over 2 and the sine of pi over 2 is going to give me 1. So if I go ahead and plot all of these points, so remember my y values are going from negative pi over 2, I'm sorry, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. My x's go from negative 1 to 1. So if I go and I plot my points at a negative pi over 2, I end up with a negative 1. Which is, so that's going to give me this point. At a negative pi over 6, which is a little bit over a negative 1 half, I end up with a positive 1 half, or I'm sorry, a negative 1 half. And I apologize, I skipped a negative pi over 4 and negative square root of 2 over 2. I have 0, 0. Then I'm going to do the same thing here. I know at pi over 2 I have 1. So what you should notice is you get something that looks like this. And this will be your inverse cosine, or I'm sorry, your inverse sine function. Now we have more than just our inverse sine. We also have our inverse cosine, our arc cosine, and arc tangent. And if you notice, the domains and our ranges have swapped from our original function. And again, we had to restrict our domains of our original functions, which is reflecting in our ranges, so that we could go ahead and calculate an actual inverse. And our final example for today uh, says use the inverse trig to write theta as a function of x. Well, based on the sketch that I have here, I know that if I wanted to, um, or based on the information that was given to me, I have an adjacent side right here and the hypotenuse. So using my trig functions, I know an adjacent and a hypotenuse side is going to give me cosine. So the cosine of theta then is going to equal adjacent or 4 divided by my hypotenuse which is x 
So now if I want to go and get theta by itself, I'm going to have to take the inverse cosine or the arc cosine of 4 over x. And at this point, because I do not know what x is, this is as far as I can take this. So in other words, if I want to get theta by itself, I just take the arc cosine or inverse cosine of this right here. And um, had I known what x was, I could actually get a numerical value. So we are going to um, conclude section 4.7 at this point. Tomorrow we will move on and look at composite functions, but for now, this is where we're going to end um, part one. On that note, have a good night, and we'll see you tomorrow in class.